Welcome to Drum and Drummer, a podcast focused on drums, drumming and drummers. I'm George Pickering and that's Ben Winty and we are both professional drummers in this business we call music. So stick around and join us as we pass the time whilst trying to stay in time. Maybe. I don't know. I don't really know the efficiency of kettles these days. I'm out of touch. It's been years. Viva Las Vegas. George, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Very well, thank you. Are, um, you, go- are you discussing it now, Vegas? I'll just say I went to Vegas. Mm. Had a brilliant time. We'll talk about it more another time because we have another guest on this week. Mm. This is episode 70. Wow, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've got the wonderful Emily Dolan Davis on the show. Mm. I first saw Emily on a Netflix documentary about drumming called Count Me In. Mm. And she's done, I mean, she's a proper full-time working drummer, doing some awesome shit. She's been playing for Kim Wilde. She's played for The Darkness. She plays on The Voice Kids. Mm. She has her own studio. She does remote session drumming. Yeah. Brilliant drummer. Brilliant yeah. guest. Yeah, brilliant guest. I We could have talked for way longer. Absolutely. I yeah. yeah I, we got about 10% of what we were going to ask. I'll just say that quick. Before every episode, we sort of have a little, you know, what are we going to ask them? And let's hope we don't run out of things to say. But um, it was great. We sort of asked the question and yeah. that was I it. I think we'll, we'll might have to get her back on because yeah, there was still loads be of stuff that we didn't really, didn't yeah. really touch upon. But um, very open and honest and um, very interesting chat about all the things she's done in the world of drumming. So mm. let's just go for it. Yep. Enjoy. George. Hi Ben, hi George. I've just hi, been listening to your last episode and being very, very entertained, I've got to say. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm loving your guys' like banter and just like, I was basically sitting here listening to it going, I was answering your questions as well and I was like, I'm not even part of this conversation, but I, already, <laughs> I want to be. So I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much oh, for having very, me. No, no, thank you for your time. Uh, thanks oh, for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. How have you guys' Sundays been anyway? Have you had a nice day? Yeah, I've been um, sleeping off some jet lag today. You went to Vegas? Is that I did right? go to Vegas, yes. How was it? Was it awesome? It was very good, yeah. What yeah. was it? Was it for a gig or something no, else? No, holiday. Oh, nice. Uh, fair, quite impromptu. Love it. Are you yeah. are you a gambling man or are you just sort of there for the entertainment, the food or? Uh, not a huge gambling man, but actually turns out I, on the last day was was a little bit of a gambling man, yeah. Well, you know, when in Vegas. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. And we did see yeah. a show. I went to see um, Penn and Teller. Oh, how um, was that? I hear oh, it was great. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah? yeah oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. What about you, George? Have you had a nice weekend? No jet lag? Um, yeah, no, no jet lag. My week was far less interesting than Ben's, but... Uh... <laughs> I yeah, don't believe no, it for no a jet lag. <laughs> no, well, this is it. I didn't go. He didn't take me, you know, which I'm sad about. Disgraceful behavior. I know this is it. I thought we could have turned it into a drum and drummer tour. But... Well, I think there's definitely opportunity for a residency in one of those hotels, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, you you were just scoping it out, weren't yeah. you, Ben? That's yeah, all yeah. it was. So this is, yeah, this is a very, it was a very tax deductible trip. Uh, <laughs> I yes, I know those trips. <laughs> <laughs> How's your weekend been? Oh, uh, yeah, it's been great. Uh, what have I been doing? Do you know what? I've been chilling out. I've been cooking loads this weekend, which is what I do to chill out, basically, because uh, I was in with the voice kids the week before. So that takes a lot of energy and stuff. So um, I just was like, right, decompress time, meal prep, cooking mm. loads of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I've had, a, I've had a lovely weekend. And what well, it's been we'll topped get to up the, nicely now. We'll get to the voice. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah. I want to I hear what you made. Are you, oh. are you is is it you are you a baker because I, I i decompress with baking sometimes you know i do bake but i wouldn't say i'm a baker although i'll tell you the thing that i've started making recently which has not only been a hit in my heart but with my family i've never known them to for them to just drop everything and be like we'll be right round is um cornish pasties oh I found this amazing recipe and now it's just like I've got all of my family, my husband just like asked me, so are you making any more Cornish pasties? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll make some more. But it's quite a fact, but it's yeah. so worth it. I can't even begin to tell you. It's so delicious. What's the, uh, what's the secret? 
mm. to a good Cornish I, pasty. Do you know what? Because I've only made this, like, used this one recipe, I don't know what the secret is. It just comes out brilliantly. Um, I spoke to my mum about it. She says that she thinks it's the amount of fat that's in the pastry is the real kind of crux so yeah, that you okay. can actually pick it up and eat it. Um, but it was just like the filling is just perfect. The white pepper, I think, is quite a thing because mm. I don't think I would have thought to put that in, but it's such a signature part of the flavour that, uh, yeah, I think I think that that must be it. So I you've think... got to season it right. Otherwise, it's too potatoey. I've made the Cornish pasty before and you just it's just all you can taste is potato. No, you don't so do you, do you put swede in yours? Because this was the whole no, reason. Did, yeah, but, oh, you but, did. But yeah. it was still sort of. Yeah, it was all potato in Sweden. <laughs> oh, not enough meat. You need some not more meat. meat and no, salt. Oh, it. and flour, a little bit of flour and butter in the filling. Mm. And then you get that lovely, like, moistness. You know, the sort of moistness that you get in a pasty I that know. kind of just wraps it all together really nicely. That's so, it. Uh, butter and salt just saves everything. You know? I mean, if you're into cooking, have you ever read a book called, um, what is it, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat? Yeah. Have you ever read yeah. That? I was, did you see the Netflix show as well? I didn't. But By that the way, this is already my favorite episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, like I said, I was listening to you two, you two talk, and I was like, "These guys are going to be my new best friends, whether they like it or not." So yeah. So, already, sometimes we this. we do worry that we actually we you know stray quite far away from drumming, but. Do you know what, though? There's some things that are really universal, not just with drummers, but with musicians, I think. And I think food is one of them. I, I Very rarely do you meet musicians that aren't, like, not just enjoy food, like, love mm. food and, like, cooking or eating it or whatever. Like, I... You know, I think about gigs that I've done um, and my husband's a tour manager and we've done a bunch of gigs together and we'll talk about the gig and he'll be saying about the loading, the venue, all this. And I'm like, I don't remember any of that. What did we eat? And if he can remember that, I'll remember the gig. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember that catering. Yeah. And then there were those tables and then we had that really amazing build your own burger station. That was that one, wasn't it? And he'd be like, yes, that's the one. <laughs> it's such a key part of the gigging day, though, isn't it? What you're going it to eat. It's, it's the one thing you can kind of control or maybe you can't like you and when you're traveling around That's there's so it. many different places and it becomes your anchor point of okay we're in this new city what we're going to eat <laughs> Yeah, That's the exactly. one thing we can ground ourselves with, yeah. A hundred percent. I've never thought of it like that, but you're right. And, and timing of food as well, I think, is quite key. Crucial. Do you eat, you know, yourself personally, do you like to eat before or do you like to save yourself to after the gig? Well, let me tell you. So, I mean, the or theory both. is eat before like maybe i can probably these days up and well it depends on the gig this is the other thing it depends how much energy i'm exerting on the gig so for instance the kim wild gig i am thrashing around like a good one so i probably can't eat until uh like before two hours before show mm. and then in theory that means i shouldn't be eating after the show however again this is my husband's fault as the tour manager he has this brilliantly awful habit of uh getting in like pizza or kebabs or burgers or something delicious after the show like as a well we've done another show and to resist that after a show when you've sweated out like all your energy and all your electrolytes it's very difficult to say no so I'll often have two dinners uh lunch and then but I don't eat breakfast so I guess I'm still having three meals a day I guess yeah. that's how that works I'm not even sure what you just asked me but anyway yeah food is awesome <laughs> Well, we need the fuel, you know, as we've said before, we're the athletes of the band and uh, yes. athletes need uh, need fueling pre and post gig. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Do you have anything on there on the on a rider? Is there anything you'd like to have backstage? That... Do you know what? I'm, I, I, I really shy away from asking for anything. And I, I don't know why that is. I've been like it ever since I started playing it. So it's like, I'll just have whatever's there sort of thing. Like I'm not the person I never want to rock the boat. You know, at the end of the day, 99.9% of the situations I'm a hired gun. So I don't want to create any waves. I'm just like, look, if, you, if there's water there, that's a bonus. But even then, I've still got, I've always got my water bottle with me. So I just need a tap 
and then I'm happy. <laughs> so yeah, I'll just I'll go along with whatever is sort of happening because I've been on tours where it's uh it's all vegan and I eat anything. Like um well, obviously I've just said about making Cornish pasties, but um yeah, so it just depends on the tour. I'll just go with whatever everyone else is doing. I'm like, yeah, all right, cool, I'll do that. So as long <laughs> as I'm not hungry and I'm not thirsty, I'm quite a happy buddy. <laughs> You've been touring with Kim Wilde. Yes. How did you get into that job and where have you been touring? Okay, so the way I got into that job is a little bit bizarre because it's a double drummer gig. So it's me and another drummer called Jonathan Atkinson. And Jonathan has, uh, he's coming up to, I think it's 20 years with Kim next year. And basically back in I want to say 2017, he couldn't do a show with Kim. And um, he was like, look, can you cover it for me? You know, we were mates. We were actually already on the road with another 80s artist called Howard Jones. We were touring around the States. Uh, again, another double drummer gig. And he just said to me, can you cover this? I was like, yeah, no worries. That's fine. I sort of knew half the band anyway through various gigs and situations over the years. So I just came in, did the job, you know, and um, got on really well with everyone. And then in the bar afterwards, uh, we were all having a drink. And um, Kim was like, oh, I really enjoy playing with you. Ever. And as a joke, I went, ha, you're just have to have two drummers now and then she looked at me she's like that's a great idea and i was stood next to the sound engineer in front of the house and i just looked at him i was like i am so sorry he's like i hate you i hate you so much and I was like, oh i'm really sorry but yeah it turns out she loves adam and the ants and they've obviously always had like two drummers and she was just like i'm so in so i started playing with her from 2018 basically here come the aliens tour and yeah we just finished up in december with the greatest hits tour so yeah i've been playing with her for the last four years and it's mainly sort of european uk european stuff that we do with her and she's massive in germany and the netherlands so we do loads of touring around there which is really good fun uh and then yeah stuff around the uk and, and all that sort of uh fun stuff <laughs> so how does the, the double drummer thing work then are you playing simultaneously are you taking in turns yeah so it's a mixture really so uh, a lot of the time we're playing together and whether that's the same parts or uh, I have a lot of electronics on my setup as well so I'll take a lot of the percussive like electronic percussive stuff with it being 80s music obviously there's a lot of programming that is on the record so I sort of like just take those sounds and it means that we can play it live which is really good but when I came into the band I basically had a conversation with Johnny and uh and he was like, look, because we're quite similar in our love of drumming in that he said to me, right, so here's what I propose. I'm just going to do all of the grooves, which I love as well, by the way. That's my type of playing, just sitting on a group. He's like, I'm going to do all the grooves. You just play all the fills. And I was like, yeah, darn it. OK, yeah, that's fine. Like, I've kind of muscled my way in on this situation. So I'll just do whatever sort of works for the song. So, yeah, we kind of just made it happen like that. So, like I say, I take all the percussive stuff, uh, the fills, any sort of extra bits and bobs. There's a little bit of acoustic percussion as well. And then we sort of like have a few sort of back and forth drum moments. And we're often sort of like looking at each other on stage, having a laugh. You know, we'll throw in a few sort of fills that only drummers would get as like uh like like in jokes i suppose things like throwing in phil collins style uh fills here and there and just kind of like <laughs> you know we're such geeks drummers are such geeks but it's so much fun when you're on tour with another drummer and you can literally just geek out day in day out it's uh it's a lot of fun <laughs> how close are you together on stage are you quite are you next to each other or are you spread out no, we're over two sides of the stage. So we've got a keys player uh, in the middle of us. So we are quite far away. And sometimes, depending on how the stage is set and the kits are set, sometimes we both have cymbal head. So there's a bit of this going on and sort of like looking, trying to catch each other's eye and kind of, you know, do all that. But uh, yeah. yeah, we can, We generally speaking, we can always see each other and sort of like have a laugh, basically. Is there uh, more Kim, Kim Wild stuff in the future? Or is it just kind yeah. of, how does it work with that? Is it, are you booked for a tour? And then it's kind of once that's done, you don't know what's going to happen next. Or is it like a contract for a certain amount of time? 
Well, yeah, I mean, initially it was only meant to be for that first tour back in 2018 and it just kind of kept rolling on. So, um, but in saying that this year, I'm not on the road with Kim because she's only got a few festivals here and there. And it is a bit overkill with the two drummer thing when you're rocking up to a festival and most people have got just one drummer. So uh, this year is going to be, it's just the voice kids for me. And then uh, just in the studio, which I love my studio so much, the remote recording thing. And I know you guys are into it too. I was so happy when I was hearing you talking about that and like about the fact that there's so much admin that goes on that people just don't understand about remote recording. They think, oh, I'll start a studio and I'll just get to play all day. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. It's about the relationships with the clients. That is 90 percent of your job. The playing is the fun bit. But yeah, it's uh, it was really nice hearing you guys talk about that and being very open about it. Well, I reckon I'll just leave you two to discuss that. <laughs> that is- <laughs> That's Ben's thing. Ben's got the studio. I do not. And that is, that's most of what I hear from him is this client's done this and this client's done that. So your oh. studio, which which you're quite clearly in now, as we could see, uh, drums yeah. and mics, is that is that on your residential or do you have a, a separate place? So it's at the end of my garden, basically. So we nice. moved into this house uh, a year and a half ago and yeah, just had the opportunity to do a, a, a purpose built building we had the space for that so um yeah it's i love it i mean i know that you totally get it just having this space is like it's more than the child version of me could have ever dreamed of in my life if that makes sense it's just i love it so much and i i love working in the studio i love working remotely working with loads of different clients you know people from all over the world there's no way that i would ever have met otherwise and just loads of different songs every day and just you know i i really and then creating relationships with people is just so interesting hearing people's stories whether that's through their music or just chatting or whatever um yeah i'm i'm such an advocate of uh like remote session musicians and just what a wonderful and new way of being a professional musician what that looks like it it really there's such a wide scope now and it's so exciting to me i don't know if that makes sense yeah yeah okay so I've got a couple of questions and these are maybe just things that I, you know, you'll deal with as well, which I'll yeah. be quite interested to know how you approach it. So if if someone's coming to you remotely to get you to drum something on, aside from like a discussion about what they're after, mm-hmm. do you kind of, do you send anything like draft through? Do you just do like a sketch out on the kit or is it like, do they trust you to go do what you do? And then how do you deal with revisions? So it depends because as I'm sure, well, you've already alluded to, everybody works slightly differently. So I actually, depending on the client, if they're a repeat client with me, then I will offer them the option to literally just leave me to do my thing and, you know, let me trust my gut and my instincts with what I do. And then uh, basically I offer them that at a lower price than my regular rate. And then I, that, like I said, it's only for repeat customers because I know how they work. They know how I work. Everybody knows where they're at sort of thing. But then um, past that, I will always just start out just doing a full take, whatever I think. And it's usually a, um, I usually comp together, you know, three takes or whatever, and just make what I feel is the right (laughs) uh, drum track for that song. And for me, it's very much a focus of, uh, lyrics if there are lyrics on this on the track and just the story that's being told with the music and then I mean this sounds so extra but it for me it's about sort of like tapping into my own life experience my emotion and bringing that to their songs so it's all very cohesive and everything has a sort of purpose and it's about adding to that and, and building more texture and depth and width to their song basically so anyway I'll do all that in my room here and get all nerdy and obsessive about that and then I will literally just sit down and I'll I'll listen to the final take that I've created and just because I think we're all perfectionists at heart which is an absolute nightmare because it means that you end up just kind of like picking over these tiny little things or at least I used to but I've managed to kind of find a way to stop myself and go right 
And as you say, people come back with revisions. So what I do is I'll sit here and I go, right, is this good enough? There may be tiny little things that I'm not happy with, but I think to myself, right, if I send this off and I've done all the pernickety little things and then they come back with revisions, I'm going to be so annoyed. (laughs) So why not send it now when I'm like 90% happy with it? If they're going to come back with revisions anyway, at least I won't feel like I've spent, you know, hours on the tiny detail and then I can get the details done in the first revision sort of thing. So um, I'll do it like that. But often I'd say... 75, 80% of the time, people are happy with the first take because I'm sure you have this too. You're often working with people that actually don't have experience in what a drum track should do on their song and what it actually will sound like. And to them, they receive the drums and their whole track has just opened up with this whole new sonic kind of feel to it that they maybe could not even envisage. So they're just like, oh my God, this is, you know, yes, done, tick. And then I'll just send over the files after that. Um, But as you say, people work really differently. And I still get funny sometimes when people send revisions and I'm like, you know, you just take it really personally. Oh my God, what do you mean you didn't like that? Like, or you don't understand what someone's saying. Like that's the thing over email or whatever. Sometimes it can get a bit lost in translation. So I'll often ask them to send me an audio recording of them just singing what they're talking about or, you know, there's always ways to kind of clarify or whether you get on a video call or whatever. Um, But yeah, I just think it's such an amazing way to work. So yeah, I'm not even sure what you actually asked me to be fair. So I'm sorry if I've just rambled on there. No, no, it's it's great to hear, you know, how other people go about it. And you're right in saying like every every client you work with is different and some things I'll do here will be fully remote. Sometimes if I can, I'll, the person will be in the control room. And so we can quickly nice. you know if they're local to the area and sort of go like, I could do a, I could do B, which do you prefer? And, yeah. and you know, that can get kind of, and sometimes I like, I don't know what you're doing. Sounds good. And you're like, okay. <laughs> but one thing I have like, quite common that I'm never really what sure to do and this type taps into what you said about perfectionism Mm. is sometimes I struggle with passing off my drum stems to someone else to deal with yep because as you'll both fully know people can ruin stuff by bad mixing oh yes (laughs) and one thing that I find or I I struggle where, where do you draw the line in terms of, you mentioned, you know, you'll comp together a few takes to kind of where you're satisfied. Like, yeah, this is what it, it's that feeling. I, and I have it with song, you know, editing, even full band stuff like, yeah, this is what it is. Yeah. That's, it's the best version of itself that you you feel you can present. Now, some people like other, they want drums on their track. So, okay, we can do drums. Now, various options. I could give you all the stems. I could do four or five takes, give you the stems. And then you're sort of leaving it up to someone else to piece together. Or you can go, as long as they're happy with what you're doing, and then you can go, I'm going to give you the final comp take, uh, take. Now, how far do you go with comping and editing yourself to be satisfied with what you're delivering? So I, like I say, I sort of try and take it to the 90% sort of mark from my perspective and I <clears throat> I don't actually send across the separate takes, although that's a really interesting idea. It's something that I have thought about, but as you say, I would fit, and I've had this before. I've had, I mean, I'm sure you've had very strange experiences where even when I send to send over a, a comp take, people will shift the whole drum track by like one bar. So it all doesn't quite line up in what is musically logical to my brain, at least. But like you say, it's part of collaborating, I guess. And the way that I get around that feeling of like, oh my God, they've ruined my drums or, you know, what have they done? I just think, do you know what? This is the part that I let go for someone else to take on and create their art with. This isn't my art, it's theirs. I'm a facilitator. I'm someone that is here providing a service. If I wanted to do something, I'll, you know, I'd get into songwriting, but I can't do that because I'm rubbish. Um, So it's, but it was definitely a shift in my head to kind of come to terms with the fact that what I provide is a tool for an artist to then carry on creating their art. And that might not be the direction that I envisaged or anticipated. It may not even be the direction that they anticipated, 
but kind of just giving the respect that what feels right to them um i feel has really helped me it doesn't make it easy sometimes sometimes i'm still like oh that's a shame but it's more that it's more like oh that's a shame because i hear that that could have been something a little bit different but it's never uh like ah, it's never sort of like crisis mode uh as it may have been in the early days but i think it like you say it's just kind of seeing it more that you are providing a service and in the same way with Kim in the same way with all the touring bands I do in the same way with the voice kids I'm very much hired gun uh, I'm a disposable commodity and and like for me that's a really freeing way of thinking because it takes the onus off of you know I am an art. I'm not an artist. I'm a drummer. I sit on the back and I get to hit things. Like it's the most ludicrous job in the world. So therefore, I'm just happy to do that. And if that makes other people happy, awesome. I, I that's great. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to turn into being an artist, then that's fine too. But I, I don't like that. I prefer tapping into other people's um, stories and and their storytelling through songs, and then sort of adding to that and hopefully elevating that a little bit. Well, I definitely learned. You know, it took me a good a good while, not only as a drummer but as a studio engineer and mixer, was going. Oh yeah, no, I I am providing a service here, and actually you know, you'd get a mix revision back and you I just think that's insane. Like <laughs> why like what's going on? What what's wrong? Like are they deaf? And then at the end of the day you have to go, well no, if that if that's what they want and if they're happy, then that's, that's cool. And then I've got the choice to publicize that record if yes. I want, or I can also hide it <laughs> deep down in the <laughs> echelon in the cave of shame. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true though. And and I really think... is, yeah. Once you can detach yourself and your ego and your pride and, you know, your, I mean, for me, it was my, my, maybe it was my self-worth, maybe it was my personality, who knows, I don't know. But once I was able to detach from that and go, like you say, I'm providing the service, actually, it makes it so much easier and more freeing to explore and do things that maybe are a little bit out of your wheelhouse or, you know, you've got, um, like, for instance, a classic one, as I'm, I'm sure you guys have had experience with this, when you have a keys player that's programmed a drum part that they want you to play and they've programmed something that literally an octopus couldn't play, it, like, there's just too many limbs going on but it does get you out of your your normal sort of like headspace it's like all right okay cool all right well this is what they want so how am I going to do this it's not about it should be this it's more like cool this is a challenge all right let's make this fun and then it's like overdubs and weird percussion and you know weird beats and accents that you never would have thought of and oh let's try that and it's just amazing the kind of the rabbit holes that you go down and that then can translate to other projects where you're like cool all right well i can do this because i've just done that and that was weird but it worked really well so let's just try this so it's it's just such an interesting journey for everyone involved i think Uh, the voice kids. Yes. So I've seen a bit of the voice adults. Yep. So it's not my cup of tea and per chance what I do on a Saturday night. But no, of course. so you're in the house band. Is this yes. a house band that plays? Is it live or is it studio taped? No, nope, it is all completely live. <laughs> and where's that filmed? So that's in uh, Elstree, where they filmed Star Wars. So I'm super happy whenever I'm there. I'm like, Harrison Ford was kicking about here at some point, And that is awesome. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I am with you. And before working with this band, you know, it wouldn't be my Saturday night. To be fair, it's still not my Saturday night. But I can categorically tell you, it's the most suited to my personality that I've ever experienced in my life. So uh, I'll tell you a bit about how it came about and and sort of the initial um, when I got into it. So uh, Ash Stone was the original drummer in the band before I got in and he decided that he wanted to leave to concentrate more on his studio stuff. So I met up with the music, musical director and I'd heard about the voice band and and what it had what it entailed and in my head it was like one of these prestigious gigs that not only were the musicians in the band some of the best in the country if not the world to be honest um it also was a heavy reading gig and when i tell you my level of reading is literally like 
maybe the new breed or like, you know, drum books, fine. Single exercises, fine. But actual like full songs, I so I would have lessons and my teacher, Mike Dolbear, would put charts in front of me like at various times over the years that I've had lessons with him. And there is there was something about that that just made me lose all sense of musicality and instinct and everything. And I just would look at it and be like, I don't know how to play drums. Like it was just horrendous. And I'd had this reaction for years. But anyway. And met up with this MD and he was like, yeah, so it's a reading gig. The charts are written for you. And I was like, so, I mean, I could just write my own charts because I do write my own charts and they're more like roadmaps. He's like, yeah, no, that's that's not going to work. It's just because the speed that we work at, that we have to work at, you know, we just need to get through them and all that sort of stuff. So it is a reading gig. And in my head, I was going, you can't read. You can't do this. Don't do this. This is mental. And then out of my mouth came, yeah, all right, yeah, I'll do it. And I was like, oh, my God. I am going to have to learn to read music. This sucks. So anyway, the next three months before the gig started, I sort of like basically created my own boot camp because I'm mental, where every day I'd be reading different types of charts and different level of charts and then like recording myself and listening back and testing myself and, you know, how good am I doing it and just trying to get better and better and better. But anyway, the way that the gig runs is that at the moment, at least, it's um, you get you have 30 songs that are uh, edited so they'll never be in the form that you know them because they have to be one and a half minute versions of songs and they can either be in the original kind of style or something completely different like i don't know playing uh sex on fire but in a cuban style for instance um that is that very possibly could be one of the briefs um so these 30 songs get uh well we get told what these songs are uh, in whatever form they're in at the time, um, maybe a few days before, so maybe three, four days before, and we get charts. So we basically go into rehearsals and we have to knock out these tunes. We do 15 a day, so it's not too bad. Um, and yeah, so we'll just sit down, right, here's the chart, listen through to the edit once, and then we'll play it. And often, maybe we'll play it twice or three times. Often it's just once. And then it's like, okay, great. Yeah, that one's done. Next one. So the turnaround of this gig is so like just bang 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 and all the songs are just different styles you can be playing you know like a single songwriter song next to a really heavy rock song like a foo or a foo fighter song say next to a jazz song with brushes next to a big band song or you know it's just musically it's chaos and i absolutely love it it's awesome it's just the best gig ever so um yeah, that's that's basically the voice kids. And then we go into the studio and we record the show basically live. Um, each kid gets one pass at doing their song in front of the judges and that's it. And uh, and then we just go on and we do the the battles and the finals. And yeah, it's it, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. But I feel I probably missed some things in there. But it's um it's a really interesting gig that really suits my personality of just enjoying playing loads of different things loads of different styles and with great musicians it's just i feel so lucky to be a part of it if that makes sense yeah yeah i think that's what i was kind of looking for really yeah was was how does it work so is that like 30 songs a week each show you're being given that that, rap, that number yeah, so it's each section of the show. So for the blinds, it's 30 songs. Um, okay. It used to be 60, but they cut down the format of the show uh, two years ago, I think. So yeah, so it's it's just 30 songs and we get that all done in one weekend, basically. Uh, with That's with us rehearsing it and then the kids come in and rehearse it and then we film it, basically. Um, so we're currently in the middle of that. We've just shot the blinds for the next season and we're going into the battles, uh, rehearsals in a week, I think. I think. I don't know. I've had no material. I don't know what we're playing. I know that there's 21 songs coming my way at some point. But yeah, I used to get really stressed out as well about it because I would have such bad anxiety. Like, you know, I just want to do a good job. And it's something that you can't really prepare for. You just kind of have to have enough tools in your toolbox to kind of 
just be able to cover a lot of different styles, basically, as well as reading as well. That was the kind of obviously that was an issue at the very beginning. It's it's not now because I kind of done enough of it. But to try and play all these styles convincingly, you know, I, I want to sound like I am a big band drummer and then I am a gospel drummer and then I am a blues drummer and it seemed legit because I'm I you know I take great pride in trying to do the very best that I can in whatever I'm doing and again it's always about serving the music and the song for me and if I can't do that that's when I feel like I've failed so um just getting into that headspace of of trying to be authentic in a genre it's it's quite it's quite a thing. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've gotten better with the anxiety of it now. I'm just like, right, I've been doing it four years now. I think I must be doing an okay job. Otherwise, they would have kicked me off the show. <laughs> so, you know, I just have to keep telling myself that and then everything seems to be fine. <laughs> well, speaking of, I'll just say it quick, speaking of anxiety, surely <laughs> does the uh, being live on telly add something to that? Because I always felt like that would be the scariest gig to do. Is yeah. That do, scary or is that do you know what? Right? I think weirdly I think the first year maybe a little bit but it was only because it was a new environment to me so but now I kind of I guess I've done it so much it sounds crazy but it's very much been normalized for me and that is always my goal I think is to kind of any situation whether that's you know touring with an artist whether that's doing the voice you know live recording whatever my I always try to normalize it and just be so prepared that I'm comfortable. And I know that if I am anxious or nervous or whatever, it's because there's something in me that doesn't feel prepared enough and feels like if something did go wrong, I wouldn't be able to resolve it. And I'm sure you guys have had the same, you know, when you've been playing long enough, you come across pretty much everything that can go wrong, whether that's on stage and you've got gear that's falling apart or your kick drum head splits and your head's gone through it. Uh, sorry, your kick uh, pedal's gone through it or, you know, your electronics mess up or, you know, I don't know. There's so many thousands upon thousands of things that can go wrong. So I feel like it sounds a bit mental, but once you've either experienced all those things of which I've experienced many of those mental things, or you've run through your head, if that did happen, what would I do? You know, with such a unique situation like The Voice, it's, it is so unique that you can't envisage what might go wrong. And there's, there's things like, for instance, forget about the actual doing the, the songs. In the middle of songs, Sometimes one of the coaches will just jump up and decide they want to do one of their tunes. And we're just like, all right, yeah, all right, cool. And you've just got to listen to 30 seconds of their tune and just play it and just <laughs> jam it and follow the singer and hope for the best and cross your fingers. And 99% of the time it's fine. Sometimes they get up kids uh, from the audience to come and do a song because the audience are bored and we're waiting for the coaches to come out. So they're like, all oh, right, do you know this song by whoever? I don't know, uh, James Blake? Or, oh, I don't know, do I? Let's see. Let's start playing it and see. So it's all very, it's almost like a like a jam. It's, it's very it's such a unique sort of scenario but anyway the point is is that it's kind of having enough I wouldn't even say confidence but just enough knowledge in sort of an experience in what I've done to kind of be like I will get through this it might not be perfect it probably won't be perfect but I will get through it and it will be okay and if I can trust the people on stage around me which I do implicitly we always have each other's backs Everyone wants everyone to succeed on that stage, including the kids, including the whole production, everything. So it's about looking to each other for that reassurance or say the guitarist, for instance, he also plays drums, say he knows what the beat is and I'm not quite getting it. He might just sort of say, oh, it's this. And I'll be like, oh, OK, I get that. OK, wicked. Or, you know, just geeing people up or whatever. So it's about that team kind of camaraderie and having a singular goal and and it's it's really a special kind of situation for sure do you hope for promotion to the voice adults does it <laughs> work like that <laughs> um do i do you know what i don't know Maybe, but i'm really happy with doing the kids not least because that's a really awful sentence to say really happy doing the voice kids <laughs> because it means that I have the chance to be in the studio the rest of the year and stuff like that. The, the adult schedule is 
pretty mental it's about i think it's about three times the workload that the kids does which is fine and it would be great fun i'd really enjoy it but in the same breath i do i always joke that i have commitment issues when it comes to like bands or gigs in that i just if i feel hemmed into one gig i freak out i'm like oh no 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 no! i need to have options i need to be able to go off and do other stuff like i get very um antsy if i'm just in one scenario i think that's why the studio has been so good for me actually it's kind of given me a base to come back to and be like okay this is my space i get to like just do what i want and and you know um but yeah in short, no, I don't think I will get promoted, but <laughs> you never know. It will be uh it will be what it will be. Will you get demoted to the, the voice toddlers. <laughs> Hopefully not, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> George, I know you're keen to ask about the darkness. Mm, yes, yeah. let's talk about that. I mean I <laughs> put me on the spot and i've done very little research oh, into your involvement in the darkness but um so this is the perfect time to know when did you play with them and, and... <laughs> so i played with them in 20 2015 is that right 2014 2014 and um i'll run you through how it came about because that's mm. probably the most interesting thing about it so i got an email through my website and this was the middle of yeah, 2014. That uh, from a uh, basically from someone that said, "Oh, hi, how you doing? Um, I just wanted to get in touch. I've got a uh, project, and I was interested to talk to you about uh, being the drummer for it. Um, can I give you a call tomorrow?" Uh, signed off Dan Hawkins, and the name Dan Hawkins rang a bell with me, and I was like. Why do I know that name? And anyway, I emailed back and I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, fine. Here's my number. Yeah, give me a call tomorrow. I really hope you were thinking of Stephen Hawkins. <laughs> <laughs> is he putting a band together? Is he is he done with the sides? And he... <laughs> That's quite funny. Um... <laughs> I was going to say also, imagine if his email was Dan Hawkins from the darkness as well. And you're like, do you know mm. what? I didn't even look. Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, who is this guy? But anyway, luckily for for me and the world, we had Google. So I, I just did a quick Google search and there were two Dan Hawkins that came up. Dan Hawkins from the darkness, obviously. And then uh, there was this guy called Dan Hawkins from Surbiton, who was a, ba a bass player. And I was like, oh. It's obviously Dan Hawkins for Surbiton. Cool, fine, put it to rest. Didn't even think of anything more about it. And then the next day, my phone rang with a number that I didn't know. I'd completely forgotten that I'd given out my number to anyone. I wasn't expecting a call because my memory is horrendous. So I answered the phone and I was like, oh, hello. And I, oh, hi, it's uh, Dan Hawkins from The Darkness. And I was like, oh. Sorry, Dan, I'm, I'm expecting a call from a bassist from Surbiton. So yeah. if you wouldn't mind yeah, just so we're gonna have bringing to up the line. Very yeah. Short. Yeah. 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 What do you want? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so that, that was my reaction. Maybe not that, but yeah, I was just like, oh, hi. Oh, it's you. How are you doing? And anyway, he basically explained that they were parting ways with their drummer, Ed, who had been with them since the start. You know, he's a mainstay. Um, and they were doing a new album. Um, and they had seen a single video on YouTube of me, which was me wrapped in fairy lights playing Best of You by the Foo Fighters. And they were like, and he and he said to me, look, you know, would you be up for coming down to the studio, having a jam, just seeing how we all get on? And like, I know I was just about to go on tour. And he said, I've seen on your website, you're about to go on tour. We do the album after you got back so we can make that work and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, all right, yeah, like, yeah, I'll come and I'll come and jam with you guys. And I thought you know what at the very least it'd be really fun to just go and play these songs that I was I was playing in covers band so you know I was playing their songs and I just thought just to play those songs with the guys who wrote them that's kind of a fun thing to do so even at the very least if nothing comes of this this will be a nice thing to do so anyway so I went and um, they sent me over a bunch of songs to learn and uh, and I learned them and went to go jam with them and it was so much fun and we got on so well ended up going out for a curry we were chatting it was just brilliant and let me tell you playing those songs with those guys ah so good it was just like ah this is how they're meant to sound this is wicked so um yeah anyway we've gone really well and they just said yeah, we'd love for you to do this album with us and I was like yeah great so basically spent how long was it two months with them uh living with them in Dan's house which he basically converted into this studio and we recorded um the album Last of Our Kind so uh that's what that was basically and then they were like oh do you fancy coming on the road with us and I was like 
I was, yeah, sure, why not? Like, that sounds like fun. Um, and we did a tour around Ireland. And who knew you could do a whole tour around Ireland? I think we spent a month touring around Ireland, which was absolutely brilliant. Uh, just doing all these like club shows, which was great. And playing all those songs was brilliant. We were playing the new album before it was out, which was really fun. Um, yeah. And then we released the album in 2015, I think it was. Maybe May 2015, something like that. Um, but then anyway, after that, it, we sort of like came to the conclusion that maybe we weren't like the best fit. Again, I was getting this horrible thing of being like, I can't be with just one band because they were saying look we'd like you to be a part of the band but what that means is we need to be a priority and you can't be playing with all these other people that you're playing with because I'm always playing with loads of different people it's just how I've always been since I was a kid and I was like you're asking me to give up this career that I've built and all these things that I do simultaneously that I love so much and I was like oh my gosh and it just became apparent that unfortunately it wasn't the right fit for either of us basically but on the upside then they got Rufus Taylor who is mm. such a good fit for them like yeah. it's just it couldn't be more perfect and yeah I'm so happy for them and it, it's a time that I'm so proud of that album is so good I wish I'd had my own studio at the time because I would have been watching Dan like a hawk because the sound of those drums on that album are one of my favorite ever they are unbelievable and I still have no idea how he got that sound and I'm gutted that I didn't have more knowledge at the time to be like Dan show me everything you're doing so yeah <laughs> aside from that I'm super happy with how that all went and uh, they're a lovely bunch of guys they really are um, I will say you summed up the whole hired gun thing perfectly there because something I used to say to people was I used to play for this artist and they basically got involved with bad management and now they've sort of gone under and haven't. But I remember thinking, well, I played with them and I was able to get out and keep on doing my thing. And yeah. I think what you were saying there was sort of you hit the nail on the head in terms of like, you know, even if it's the darkness and they're like, we need you to not do anything else. I think it's just really interesting to hear that, that you were like, well, I can't do it then. You know, and it is that thing of you're into, yeah, you're stuck in one thing. It can, yeah, it's scary yeah. to me. Can I tell you, though, that was the hardest decision I've ever had to make. Yeah. Like, because you can imagine like instantly in my head, I was going, oh, my God, everyone's going to think I'm mental to give up this opportunity. But like you say there's this thing in me that's just like I can't be I tell you what it I liken this a lot actually to when you join a band or you start a band or whatever it's kind of like you're finding two or three or four or five other people that you're going so we're going to spend the rest of our lives, lives together. We all need to have the same singular goal. It's like getting married to two, three, four other people. And, you know, it's hard enough finding one person like that, let alone a whole bunch of people. And, yeah, you might fall out and all of that sort of stuff. But for all of you having to be on that same journey and make sure that everyone has that same goal, that's hard. And, you know, I, I'm just... I've not, I've not built that way. Not, I mean, maybe it will change. Maybe one day I'll run into a bunch of people and go, oh my gosh, we all want the same thing. But I love, I just love sort of being a part of something for a bit and then transitioning somewhere else. And maybe that's in tandem and maybe that's not, and who knows? But yeah, it's it's the hired gun thing. There's a freedom that comes yeah. with the dispense dispensableness not sure that's a word anyway being dispensable in a musical situation some people find that quite scary i find it incredibly liberating so i george i feel like you feel the same way to yeah. me <laughs> no it's just that was fantastic to hear like it was um i think actually yeah ash Sohn when he was talking about the reason he stopped doing the voice was it i think you remember him saying he almost felt trapped i don't want to yeah. misquote him but he was like yeah, it's too much time yeah, it is. My own thing and yeah. Well, going back to Ben, what you were saying, that's exactly the reason when you were saying about do you want to get promoted to doing the adults as well? In a way, I don't because mm. I know the workload and it's great to dip into, so much fun, but I want it to stay fun. And I feel like it's a really nice balance to be able to do the voice and still go and tour and then still be able to be in the studio. It's kind of it just really works for me in terms of like different stuff and keeping myself interested because I'm like some crazy ADHD, ADHD drummer. That's why I feel like as I'm saying this, I'm like, maybe that's a thing. <laughs> I think it's a while, you know, it's a, it's a good reason people go into this, the art industry, you know, whatever sort of thing is because we don't want the 
monotonous it's the same thing for 30 years we don't really want that we we like the variety and that's what keeps it all interesting yeah and even if you know mixing here i'm still mixing but every band's different every client's different every day's different and it just keeps it fresh now i'm gonna do a double segue george you ready right this this is right this is killer so this ties into one your video of food fighters cover with your fairy lights yeah and two nico mcbrain saying it took him 10 years to find those four people that he had the synergy with to be in Iron Maiden with. And both those things feature on the Netflix documentary. Oh, Count me in. Very good. Nailing it. And look at this guy, professional <laughs> podcaster, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so you were, I, I've, I've now watched this documentary twice. It's the first time I saw you as a drummer. And since asking you to come on the show and you very kindly agreeing, I have since watched it again. I mean, A, pretty good to have a drumming documentary out there because amazing. it's great, you know, that it's putting drums front and centre where they should be. Um, and you were in it. So tell us about that. Well, first of all, how in the world did that happen, eh? I mean, it's a surprise <laughs> to me as anyone. I was like, how have I ended up in this scenario? Because... That initial project was literally a random interview that I did with, um, so it was Louise King, who used to be the editor for Rhythm magazine, who I've known for years. And she called me up and she said, look, me and my mate, we're doing this uh, this short film. We don't really know what it's going to be yet. It's kind of a documentary, but it's centered around drummers um, and just about sort of telling story of the drums or whatever and, I, and she said do you want to be involved and I was like yeah sure I'll come do an interview and she came around to my house and all that sort of stuff and that was really nice and you know I get asked to do a bunch of different interviews and stuff like and I never think anything of it I'm just like my normal blah, 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 chatting away so I think it was about a year later she said oh by the way we're actually going to turn this into a documentary and I was like oh cool all right that sounds great like again not thinking much of it I just done a random interview and that was it so oh yeah so here are some of the drummers that are going to be on it as well and I was like oh well that that sounds quite interesting and then maybe three years later they were trying to find people to take it on and to release it and all that so three years later I get an email from the director saying by the way it's coming out on Netflix tomorrow and I was like Wait, what now? Sorry, I'm sorry, what? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's literally how it came about. And and I watched it and I, like, forget about the fact that I was in it. I was absolutely blown away by it because I just thought it was beautifully made. Like, I come from, so my dad is a little bit in the TV and film world. So I've very much been brought up watching a lot of different types of documentaries and films and stuff. And and I, 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 I don't know, I... I'm a bit critical, shall we say, sometimes of stuff. Let's put it like that. But this, just that opening shot of like going across the observatory, I just thought, this is actually a really good film. This is going to be good. And it just looked beautiful. And then you get into the stories of the drummers and the way that they tied them together with all these sort of like links that each drummer had with their own experiences. I was sat there going, me too, me too. And then obviously I did actually come up on the screen, which is a little bit weird. Yeah. But, you know, it's very, it was just such a wonderful way to represent the drumming community and how, like the similar experiences that we've had, but also the closeness that we all have in the experiences that we have. And that, I thought that they captured that so beautifully. And in, I, I just I just really appreciated it because I, I always say the drum community is like one huge family. You know, we all just love each other. We do. I don't know where that comes from, but, you know, it's like us chatting now. We could be old mates. Like, it's just easy. We just have a laugh. You know, if I ran into one of you on the road somewhere, but like, hey, doing big hugs, you know, if people that I've never met before that are drummers, I'll be putting my arm around and I'll like, oh, come out for a drink, you know, and it just captured that camaraderie so beautifully. And the passion that comes with, you know, picking up the sticks for the first time and just the experience of being a drummer, I just thought it was just, yeah, it was an amazingly made documentary. And like I say, I'm not sure really how I managed to get in that documentary, but I'm so glad that I got to be a part of it. And I feel so privileged and lucky to be, you know, sat there amongst absolute legends and just 
wonderful humans like just you know oh yeah anyway I I I don't even know what else to say <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it <laughs> yeah yeah I think it's interesting like as you say like we, we've everyone we've spoken to on here has been so whatever their level you know has been so open and, and friendly and just up for doing it that's the key thing and we you know we ask people and the hit rate is pretty high with yeah great we'd yeah. love to come on you know and we as drummers we like talking about drums and yeah it's an interesting topic because there's there's so many things different things you can do with drumming so many different avenues of careers and and just the equipment and but i think maybe fundamentally is there anything to be said for the fact that we're usually the only one in the band with with the only drum obviously the exception of apart from me apart yeah from, i managed yeah. to get on gigs with two drummers all the time <laughs> but yeah not and like i hear footballers say the goalkeepers they're they're weird they're their own little whatever team they play for they're their own group they have a goalkeepers union you know so and like we're like something funny i've never heard that but that makes a lot of sense so when i was a kid i used to play football a lot and i was always the goalkeeper me too <laughs> yeah That's i like being on my own but with other people no one else is doing this job no just me but i'm, I'm gonna be a foundation that you can go and <laughs> Build you go on. Frolic, frolic yeah, over do there all the skills, I but... hold it down. <laughs> I love that. You could see it in your face, Emily. You was like, oh, I've got a goalkeeper anecdote. I was like, where, where is this going? <laughs> I've never heard that. I've never even thought about that. But what you're saying is brilliant. Uh, Emily, well, who is your favorite delivery company? <laughs> My favorite delivery company? Like yep. courier service. People who... You order something online. <laughs> I can't believe I obviously didn't get to the end of the. I was going to say I didn't thing. want to yeah. be blunt about yeah. it. Yeah, but... <laughs> you weren't doing this on the one with just you two. I oh no, we why this is for guests. Yeah. Well, yeah. early days we we chatted a lot about delivery companies and the okay. various issues and. Oh, there's so many issues. Yeah, and so we thought, well, we want to hear what you know the big drummers of this world, mm. who they like the and who they hate. Ones. Mm. Oh well, I can I can tell you who I definitely do not like. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, what are they now? Every Hermes, no. whatever rebranding because they're so awful. Like I don't like speaking badly about anyone, but honestly, they just are terrible. I I just don't like them very much at all. Um, okay, I'm I'm only going to say this one because the delivery driver that does our local route, he's so lovely and chatty. He's always complaining about a bridge being closed or something like that, and he's an APC driver. So there, right. yeah. I think that's the first time for APC. I haven't even heard of them. Maybe they're. I don't. I don't even know. I think they're national APC. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what it stands for. That's it. Everyone's yeah. got different reasons, and yeah. if it's the driver that it makes it good, that's yeah. you know. He's yeah. always making fun of the things that I'm ordering, so that's nice. <laughs> Another symbol. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see. What are you, a drummer or something? Yeah, exactly. Oh, nice hobby you've got there. That's always a nice one. Uh, yeah, all right. That's nice. Wait, wait, wait. But what are your guys' ones? I want to know what your favourite delivery uh, company no is. No one's ever asked us. I think best DPD because you get the tracker. Yeah, DPD's great. Yeah, all that. Worst? I don't know. I, I feel like... I think worst is also DPD because once they... <laughs> messed up like really bad like they had you know that thing where it's like oh we tried to deliver oh, to your door yeah. but you weren't in and i was like i was i was here yeah i was like here. you're, you you're literally lying to me ups yeah. does that as well apart yeah. from they don't give you the tracker but they just say oh no it's been delayed tomorrow now and i'm like i've yeah. literally stayed in my house all day for you and yeah. you're giving me no explanation and apparently you'll be with me tomorrow okay so that's so dpd and dpt yeah. is your answer Best and worst and what about you ben it's got to be yeah dpd at the top for me yeah. um i have a weird love of fedex like <laughs> I think it's just from Castaway. Just I was going to say, even though they're plane crashed it. and it's it was so a nightmare, cool. I'm still like, there's something about the logo, like the US. I, I like the US, you know. Like, yeah, FedEx, pretty cool. Um, I think the worst just recently, um, UPS dicked me around with picking up, we're actually picking up a parcel. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they they eventually. It was a quite an expensive thing, a bit of studio gear that had had to go back to the manufacturer in Germany. And um, yeah, wasn't wasn't a smooth um, mm. the transaction. 
That's so disappointing. they got some catching up to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. not ideal. But, I, I, I kind of want to change my answer to DPD because that tracker thing is so good because it means that you really yeah. can just be in in the sort of five minutes before they come round. Yeah, I might have to get rid of my APC driver now. Oh no, don't. Poor old All right, we'll see with APC. Really. I'll He's stick to be my listening guns. to this, yeah. being like, oh, I thought <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah, but then I'll just say, well, you said my drumming was a hobby, so yeah. you know, swings. Oh, was that bounce. true? Did he actually say that? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a classic. You see an old relative. How's the music going? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was what my granny used to always say. Well, it's a nice hobby, dear. And I was like, yes, okay. Yes. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. I drumming. don't mind. <laughs> Keep trying. Well, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you so Absolute much. Absolute pleasure for to me. chat to you. Um, and it's great just everything you're doing and everything. Um, you're going to keep doing in the drum world. Well, um, same goes for you guys. And I want to see you at a drum show so I can come and oh, give you will. both a hug. What's the best I'm one? The best one. Well, UK drum show is sort of the one to go to for sure. Um, and then I would say as well, get over to Nam. That is like drum show, but on acid. It's amazing. You'll be exhausted. You'll probably get sick, but it's so worth it. It's um, yeah, just yeah. Start off with the UK drum show, though. Just start mm. smaller first. Uh, and uh-huh. then also, if you like vintage drums, there's one up in Birmingham, I think, in September called the National Drum Fair. That's another really nice one. If you like vintage gear, it's mm. kind of it's a bit of a different vibe. But it's um, yeah, if you want to spend some money, go there. <laughs> it's very nice. A bit yeah. too nice, <laughs> if anything. And where can people find you and all that you do? So find everything that I do at emilydrums.com. All the socials are on there, all the different things that I do. And and yeah, it I I won't go into it. Just go and search. There's too many things. <laughs> so <laughs> I like to keep myself busy, basically. That's my whole vibe. So Great. yeah. Well, thank you so much again for coming on. Thank yeah. you, guys. Uh, been a pleasure. And yes. um we'll see you at the drum show very soon. Amazing. See you guys later. Thanks so much. Cheers, Emily. Thank you. Bye. There we go. That was our chat with Emily. Yep. Interesting delivery uh, option at the end there. Yeah. We're going to have to look up APC. Yep. See what they're about. Mm. What do you reckon that stands for? APC. Always. Parcel. Courier. Courier. Always parcel courier. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Courier or courier? Not courier. I'd say courier. Yeah, because courier is if you want more curry or you want it, you want <laughs> you want something that smells like or tastes like curry to be more of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or could you make this a bit more, you know, you're at a restaurant, you're an Indian restaurant and you order a curry and you're not happy with it. And the way it goes, what aren't you happy with? You go, I just want it more courier, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And they're <laughs> more carrier. I tell you what, George, I've uh, not been listening to you there for a second. No, because I, 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 I drifted I, in and out. To yeah. be honest, <laughs> because I've just looked up APC delivery. Couple of things for you. Yeah. One, they got a PI postcode. They're oh. based in Sedgensworth. I don't know where near that is. where I grew up. Near okay. F- just west side of Fairham, near right. Whiteley. Mm. Right. Second of all, they have delivered something for me before, and it was actually. Baymax's Ashes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They it's... were entrusted with bringing my boy home. Mm. So I have had them before. Baymax was Ben's Hamster hamster, number one. if you're listening. Yeah. 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 And wondered who that was. Numero so. uno. Um, so yeah, I have. To, and from what I can remember, they did They did good. Yeah. Well, And good. during lockdown as well. And, uh, yeah. you know. So, but yeah. A local, local to us. A local well, that delivery must, company. She must be local then right well they do nationwide mate ah just there fair enough they don't just deliver in the po area (laughs) no (laughs) quite uh it's just some some guy on a bike and he can't he can't travel further than 20 miles yeah but yeah interesting choice that's not uh, they've not come up before so always good to see a new player enter Mm. the game Mm. also yeah Probably quite cool playing. I believe I believe in a thing called love with the actual darkness. Yeah, I was thinking when she said oh, I played this in a covers band. You know, it's it's that song, haven't you know? we all? And yeah, that'd be mental. That would be good, be wouldn't it? It would be good. I yeah. see what she means about you know, if that's all it is, 
then great, you know? Yeah. And then you end up touring with them around Ireland. That's that. I mean, that's perfect example of just keep your hopes low. <laughs> I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, Going on a tour of Ireland. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't think we've got anything else to say. That was... Um, no, that was... no. I think we're going to do at least one episode, maybe more, just us. Mm. That we're going to record soon. Because quite a lot to talk about. Yeah. Vegas. Um, you've started your new job. Yep. Yeah, very close to moving in with Elfie. I don't know or when this we'll comes have out. Just I think I will have moved just in, but we can yeah. talk about that. Yep. Um, my little trip to the states, mm. the United States. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Just Although they, some of them over there are trying to make it not united at all because mm. the right have gone mental. But that didn't factor into my holiday at all. I had a wonderful time. Yeah, so we've got some catching up to do. And we're not yeah. that far off doing our first gig of the year together. No. As long um, as I can book it off work. That's all I'm worried about. <laughs> is well, how is a full-time job going to affect gigs? But it's not. Because if, if they don't let me do a gig, I'll say, well, do you know what you can do with your job? Nah, I probably shouldn't talk about the job on here in case they'll listen. They're not going to listen. Nah. But, um, but yeah, we've got a gig together. And you're on an electric kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got to sign a form about the fucking in-house sound system. Yeah. I mean, it's it's insane. It's it's, it's um worth delving into actually. Mm. How much effort this venue have put into making sure bands play quiet. Mm. Like it, it's quite. I'd describe it as overkill. Yeah. Because fundamentally, if you've got to do all that, if you've got like a four-page PDF explaining everything about the PA system you've got to plug into, what you can't do, what you can't... I almost think like your venue's not suited to having bands. <laughs> yeah. Really? Maybe you shouldn't have live music if yeah. it's that bad. Mm. But done it all before. Yep. And, and it'll be something interesting to talk about. That's That's the one upside now to bad gigs. We've got a place for... You know, to discuss them. <laughs> yeah, true. It's almost worth doing them for Very that. Very true, yeah. Well, let's bounce. Yep. Because uh, I've got some jet lag to shake off. This is it. Yeah. And I've got a spag bowl to uh, complete. Ooh, lovely. The bowl's in the slow cooker. Just mm. got to make the spag. Sure, you know. sure. <laughs> That's a good choice. Good I choice for made, I Well, I made it because I thought, I don't want to eat before we do the interview. Yeah. I'll have it ready for after, but I don't want to make a whole spag bowl from scratch. At, I mean, it's half eight now in the evening. I've yeah. got work tomorrow. <sighs> just have it ready. Just got to make some spag. Spag's easy, you know. Sure. Boil the kettle, put it in. Hey, presto, there's a spag bowl. Well, that's the thing. Okay, so when you're boiling, you, you know, this is the little pasta trick. Yep. That I'm pretty sure everyone knows. Don't well, fill your pan you... up and just put it on the hob. No. No, God, no. No, God, God you'll no. be there forever. With energy but, prices. Oh, I mean, well, that's the other thing. What, what's cheaper, the boil in the kettle mm. or the heating of a full pan of water? Because that's a kettle question. is electricity, but it's a big yeah. burst. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I don't really know the efficiency of kettles these days. I'm no, out of touch. What, it's been what, years what, since I've delved you, into that hot what topic. What were you going to say? Well, obviously, even if you're doing the kettle trick, mm. put a little bit of water in the pan... Yeah. Get that boiled up so you're not pouring boiling water into a cold pan. Mm. But do not heat the pan up without some water in there. No. So, no. And Rookie if anyone error. doesn't know that trick, what have you been doing with your life? Yep. It's quite it's nice as well when you've got that sizzle mm. of boiling water. Just a little little bit at the bottom of the pan. Obviously at the bottom of the pan. It's not going to be at the <laughs> middle point of the pan. Just pop a little <laughs> bit of boiling water on the side of the pan. <laughs> um, but then you pour that kettle in whoosh, whoosh, you know? Yeah. Great. Yeah. That's what I live for. So if you've learned anything from today's episode, yeah. um, it's that. Poor old pop, Emily. Pop. She gave a fantastic <laughs> podcast performance just telling us everything. And we're just ending this episode with... How to, how, to, how, to how to quickly boil water <laughs> for your spaghetti. It's good stuff. It's good um, stuff. Right, I'm going to go sleep. Yeah. Right. Sleep well. Thanks, mate. <clears throat> And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Drummond's Drummer. 
You can find us on Instagram at Drum and Drummer Podcast. And you can send us an email to drumanddrummerpod at gmail.com. Remember, just pick up the sticks and twat it.